Vocês conseguem ouvir bem a gente do fundo? Sim. 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 Tem lugar na frente também, é. se quiser ouvir mais de perto. Porque daí a gente fica sem... Melhor sem assim, o microfone, se a gente conseguir. Se tiver alguém tiver problema para ouvir, me avisa, daí a gente ajuda. Então agora a gente vai fazer Os lugares da frente ficaram mais... Se ela quiser usar... Ok. So deixa, I, ela, deixa ela com o microfone, que eu acho que... Ok, então, eu sou Pia Maria Turin, eu sou fundo da Europa Agile People, eu sou da Suíça, eu me chamo de um híbrido entre IT, Agility, Leadership, HR e Finance, porque eu tenho um degree da Universidade de Finance, University, believe it ou não, mas eu Finance. And uh, I used to uh, work in uh, HR and IT, being the bridge. We were implementing talent management systems in, in the world. Um, not actually delivering so much value as I would like to have delivered doing that. So I stopped to do that um, when I found Agile in 2009. I became an Agile master. And then uh, I started to live my life according to the values and the principles of agility because it was very natural for me. I, I believe I'm an agile person in my personality. And then you ask, can you be an agile person? And yes, I believe you can be an agile person. It's when you believe in the values and the principles of agility. Uh, and if you feel that this is really right, there's a lot of common sense in those principles and in those values, then you can be an agile person. So, do you have any questions? Perfeito. Pessoal, uh, Alison Fernandes aqui, eu sou consultor em Business Agility e Inovação. Trabalho hoje com uma farmacêutica, com a Merck globalmente, uh, e em comunidades ágeis e fazendo eventos pelo Brasil inteiro, super legal tá trabalhando com isso, e mais legal ainda estar tá recebendo a Pia Maria aqui hoje com a gente. E eu, como eu falei mais cedo, sou o Thiago Brant, fundei a Agilers há quatro anos e meio atrás, mas também comecei na agilidade em 2009, quando eu fiz o primeiro curso de Scrum Master e não parei nunca mais até hoje, e é isso. Também sou consultor, trainer e tudo mais, de tudo que tem a ver com gestão, liderança, modelos ágeis, eu acabo abraçando de alguma forma, que foi como eu cheguei até a Jairo Pico. Bom, Leandro Garcia, sou cofundador da InnoFlow, nosso foco lá está em Business Agility, e, nossa, vocês estavam falando de ágil aqui, eu... 2008, rapaz, estou ficando a barba branca aqui, tá? Tem história, faz um tempinho já. Uh, e a ideia, acho que do Nexus foi justamente trazer um pouco disso tudo, né? E um pouco além, né? Acho que está na hora da gente ir um pouco além. Acho que Biz a gente é um pouco disso. Essa é a ideia da agilidade de negócios e ir para frente e dar o próximo passo. E aí, pessoas, people are, né? Business are made of people. I will do the first question. I will fazer a primeira pergunta. Uh, last week we had the Agility in Finance course in Sweden, the first one in the world, and we talk about the innovation in management, yeah, because we have innovation in product, in production systems and everything, but, and management. And I will talk uh, uh, earlier today that uh, the management is not uh, evolving, and what do you think about the innovation in management models, so innovação na gestão. Actually, I think it's coming. We have been saying that for maybe 13, 15 years in the Agile movement, in the Agile community, that innovation in management is coming, but we have seen nothing yet. But now, with this agility in finance, I think we finally have managed to crack the nuts, so to speak, to understand how this will happen. Uh, because it's about a lot of things that the governance principles and the uh, management processes. 
uh, of beyond budgeting, for example, how you decouple the organization, how you think about finance in a totally new way and about budgeting in a totally new uh, way, where you work with forecasting instead of the annual budget, you follow up on targets a lot more often, you decouple targets, monitoring, forecasting and resource allocation. Uh, and also you decouple accounting from monitoring and forecasting. So accounting, yes, that's the legal stuff, right? You need to get the legal numbers right. But you don't need to use that many numbers in forecasting. You can work a lot more with the relative measurements like KPIs and OKRs and use visual tools to present it like bubble diagrams or word clouds or simple diagrams where you can see, okay, we are improving or we are increasing, that's enough. You don't actually need to compare to the actual precise detailed numbers. And we don't look at, if you have a variation, let's say you, you, you had a goal for the year and then it turns out to be something else, then that's not a deviation that is bad. That's a deviation that is good because it's the reality that is reflected in the forecasting. The reality is not reflected in the plan, which people have been thinking before. That the plan is the good stuff, that's what we should follow. But if the reality changes and there is a plan different from reality, what is the right path to choose? I'm asking you now. So in the past, we've been trying to keep the plan. Don't have any deviations from the plan because then you're a bad manager. You made a mistake. But this all changes when we realize far too late that it's the reality that is the truth. Great. Uh we had the opportunity to hear you uh, yesterday at Agile Brazil, and that was a fantastic speech, so thank you for that. And there was um, one quote that I took note there, um, a moment when you uh, talked about uh, best practices and how only mediocre companies apply best practices. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, of course, because best practice today is already past practice, a week later, because it's changing so quickly. So it's only mediocre companies who use best practice, because you will never be better than your competitor if you use best practice today. Because everybody's using best practice, right? So you will not be unique or special or different or better than your competitor if you use best practice. Best practice is post practice. It's common sense, isn't it? Good, thank you. And uh, the true agile, uh, agile companies have their own process and ideas, not frameworks or something that they use from other companies. And the uh, when we talk about management, it's something that other companies can't copy to. You know, because when we do our management in a different way that everyone is doing, it's a, it's a thing that other companies cannot copy. So what do you think about this? Like the, the production system and everything, it uh, can be copied by other companies, but not the management systems. No, I think that the people cannot be copied, right? And the, the way we learn and the, how fast we learn in companies cannot be copied. So the only competitive advantage that is left for the future is to learn faster than your competitors. This is the winning competitive advantage in the future of work. Learn faster than competition and then you're ahead. A learning uh, organization is an agile organization. It's almost the same thing, right? Learning and agility. 
It's about learning quickly. And then you need to make it safe to make mistakes for people. Because if you don't make mistakes, you don't learn. So psychological safety becomes the platform, the necessity that you build trial and error and then experimentation on. And the, the book, Agile People, because I think everything started with the book when we wrote this, and why Agile People and why you wrote this book? And that was because we worked in, as I said before, we worked in talent management. We was, uh, um, I was a project manager in this um, uh, configure, IT configuration and implementation and rollout projects within talent management. So we were a small IT company working together with big Swedish companies like Volvo and uh, IKEA, Electrolux and the SKF. And uh, we were translating the requirements from HR to IT. So we were kind of the bridge between. And the IT and HR were speaking different languages. So we had to translate between those departments. Um, and, and we worked with it. What was your question? <laughs> why, you, why you wrote the book? OK, yeah, why I wrote the book, that's a totally different reason, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, the reason for writing the book was that I needed course material for my Agile HR course because there was no, uh, nothing written in that area. So I had to write the book myself that I needed for my course. Because we had a lot of experience of working with HR and HR process even. And I saw a lot of things in these big companies that I thought, this is not common sense, what are they doing? They are saying one thing and then they are doing something else, right? So there, there is the structure culture misfit that I talk a lot about in my book and that I mentioned, that, that we have structures and processes and methods and tools and systems that speak one language. And then we have the, the people talking about the values and, and the things that we want more of. We want more collaboration. But then we have an individual performance process in place where we reward for individual performance. But that doesn't breed collaboration. It breeds competition between people. So we have a structure that talks a different language than what we say with our mouths. And there is a mismatch here between many different things in, in big organizations. So I started to think a lot about this, and this is not common sense, right? So, so I wrote the book. I, I produced the Agile HR training because we saw in those uh, big talent management projects that the principles from the Agile Manifesto could be applied to anything. They can be applied to your private life, they can be applied to, to HR, to finance, to marketing, to leadership, to everything. So we said, okay, what if we applied these principles from the Agile Manifesto onto HR? Could they work with those principles as well? And what would that look like? And then we started to to talk about it and work with that with our big clients in Sweden. And I did this uh, Agile HR course. I think I had two participants in my first training. N none of them paid. And and then it started slowly, slowly, slowly to roll. This was in 2011, I did the first Agile HR training. Uh, I think it was the first one in history ever in the world. <laughs> Somebody told me, this is not possible to do because this is a non-training, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but then, yes, uh, I was very stubborn. I'm, I've always been very stubborn. And if I believe in something, then I will do more of that. So I did more of it. Uh, tried to learn a lot and tried to also apply it to leadership and then I learned more about human motivation. I started working with the risk motivation profile 
And in 2015, we, we um, uh, that Agile People was just a brand before that. My real company was Green Bullet Solutions. But then in 2015, I say, I don't want to work with the talent management systems anymore. This is just fake. We are not creating value for our customers. It's just a mess. We're just helping HR to uphold, you know, the hierarchy, the top-down hierarchy. Uh, that's HR's goal. It's to keep the hierarchy in place with succession management and performance management, all of the HR processes, really, the purpose of it is to keep the hierarchy the way it is. We have career planning, it's about, uh, you know, growing, getting more and different positions and climbing the career ladder up. There is only one way and it's up or out. Up or out. There's no other career. In, in the most traditional organization. So I felt we are not creating value. Uh, we are just making it difficult for people to perform and be happy. And I really wanted to contribute to people being happy, performing, and productive, and you know, feeling good at work. So that's why I say, okay, I'm going to spend full time just working with agile people. And I started a company in 2015. And then I wrote the book in 2017, and then it's been two more books, actually, that not so many people know about. But it's the Agile People Picture Book, which I think is really a better book, because it's a lot of visualizations inside that book. And then there is the Agile People Principles Book, which is a co-creation project with 35 Agile people from around the world. Mm. So that's why I wrote the wrote book. We came to Brazil before and run a Agile HR course. How many people in this training? Uh, the training I did four years ago. I think we were 85 in that training. Yeah. A little more than two. And, and those paid, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. We were 85 in that Agile HR course. Also did the course couple of courses actually in South Africa with the same number of participants. Big, big rooms with big round tables, like 10 tables with nine people around each table. It, it, it's a good training to do with large groups because it works. And uh, the pictures from Agile people born, was born in South Africa, but then she can tell the history later. You said uh, we need to make fail safe. I understand, because we need to create new capabilities. The world is changing faster. Uh, when you try to create new capabilities, you need to learn new things. When we are, are learning, we, need, we will fail. It's normal to fail when we learn. Uh, so we need to be safe. Uh, to, to fail. Um, but this is a difficult year. We are talking about that for our around the world. How can I say be, uh, be safe? Be safe? Yeah. yeah, we talked about that in class today that when the times are difficult, then companies tend to centralize everything instead of decentralizing, instead of using the collective intelligence of the organization, top management tends to centralize everything and, and take back the power, take back the control, because they are scared and, and they are fearful, rightfully. But it's in this, these times that you should really use the people of your organization and really, you know, be vulnerable as a leader. Hey, we have these problems. What, what can we do? How can we overcome these problems? Do you have any ideas that could help us? Because you have so many thousands of people who have probably very, very good ideas and solutions that if we listened more as managers, we could probably use a lot of them and solve uh, 
uh, many of the problems that we have. And it's sad that companies don't see that, that they are doing the opposite. They are centralizing when they should keep decentralizing in these times that we have. Because with collective intelligence, we can do a lot more. Together, we can solve problems that people with a limited knowledge, which top management, for example, ha has limited knowledge about what happens in the organization and what works and what doesn't work and so on. And maybe we also have people who have new creative ideas for new services and products that our customers want and need that we could focus on instead of the old products. Uh, products and services that would be more appropriate for a complex changing world. Anything on my Yeah, you mentioned during your career that you worked with uh, very big companies, very big, big traditional companies. We have a, a few ones uh, as clients as well, and big challenges when you talk about, you know, agile transformation, about transforming people, right? Not only processes or procedures, but people. And uh, we know that sometimes in these companies, hierarchy, as you said, is still basis. We know that the uh, basis is hierarchy, and we know that it's a challenge to transform when top management sometimes don't understand and don't maybe want to be transformed, but the base, the people of the basis uh, want and uh, understand. So we start bottom up, but sometimes it usually right reaches higher level management, and uh, in very big, big traditional companies. How did you overcome that and uh, how can we maybe try uh, to really overcome this challenge when we have rigid structures and top management that don't understand, uh, don't, don't want maybe to create the safe environment? Yeah, there are many answers to your question and many, many answers and many different ways of working with this kind of companies that you are talking about. So what you need to do uh, is to focus on the people who are really positive to change, uh, the people who are your innovators, your ambassadors, spread them out in the organization and you give them what they need uh, and they will be very positive about changing. They, they are your innovators. Then comes your early adopters. They come next, right? And then comes your, your late adopters and your early majority and late majority and the laggards. You shouldn't focus your energy on the laggards because they will never ever change, right? So you focus your energy on the people who are already positive to change. And uh, the other thing is, what we see, say in uh, Agile People Works is awareness first. Why do we need to change? It's a, it's a matter of, it's ultimately a matter of being competitive and being profitable. And this is the language that top management understand, right? So when, when more and more people will demand uh, a new kind of culture and a new kind of uh, behavior from, from management, they will need to change in the end because no, nobody would want to work in their company. They will be outcompeted by newer, faster, smaller companies with better ideas about how to manage people. Uh, because all the good people they will be sucked up by other companies. So they will stand there without people in the end. And since uh, the business is the people, if you think about an organization without people, what do you have left? You have uh, maybe some computers somewhere, and of course, soon they will start to think for themselves, maybe, with AI and so on, but we are not there yet. So uh, also, there is the awareness, why do we need to change? There is the training, how then should that happen? What can we do as agile leaders? And then it's the coaching to keep the, the new behaviors. But there is really no motivation for, um, 
executives on that level to change because they have worked very hard to get where they are today and they want to stay on that level. They get fat bonuses, they get a lot of rewards, they have a nice position, they have status, uh, everything uh, is, is there for them. So why should they want to decide that we are moving to something strange called agility? that would serve the people but not me, you know? What will happen to me when, uh, when we go agile? What will happen to, to my power and my position and my money that I earn today? So it's a fear, of course, and it's, uh, it's very well built under, under me. Okay. Here we go again. <laughs> And, and it's a true, a true fear. Uh, and uh, what can we do? Um, I think some, some leaders will change. Yes, some will never change. I know that Equinor in Norway, uh, a company using Beyond Budgeting, uh, Bjarte Buxnes wrote the book, Beyond Budgeting. It's about agile for finance. And he said that they've been working with managers for 20 years in that organization, trying to, to change uh, the culture, the climate, the leadership, and so on. And still, there are people who are resisting and will not do according to the new ways of working that they have. Uh, even top management says that we have to do this. There are still middle managers who are not on board with that. They will never be. So in some companies, they hire those managers. In some companies, they give them a lot of um, money to leave. Like in ING, I worked with a big bank in the Netherlands. They are called ING. And they are very famous for doing quite well uh, I, I would say it was a successful change from an unagile old traditional bank to a more agile bank. The managers on the higher levels, almost all of them stopped to work eventually at ING because they were not needed anymore and they lost all, all their nice bonuses and so on. But they got good jobs at other banks because they had been through this change and the other banks wanted to learn how to do it. So they saved themselves in the end, anyway. So, um, in one Swedish bank, uh, Handelsbanken, which is a good example of also beyond budgeting and agile for finance, there was a very strong uh, leader who said, unless, uh, unless I can decide how we make this change from a bank that was very near going bankrupt to a profitable bank, I want to uh, decide how to do it. I want free hands to, to do this change. This man was called John Valander. And then Handelsbanken is the bank since 1973 who has never needed any support from the government or the state in Sweden. It's one of the most profitable banks in the world. Uh, and they have decoupled their organization. And they don't have any command and control top-down structures anymore. Because he got the free hands they were very motivated to change as well because they were going bankrupt if they didn't do something really uh, drastic. Thank you very much. So they had to change. There, but there are more answers to your question. <laughs> there, as, what, what everybody can do with an organization is to uh, affect. Everybody has a span of control. You can always con um, you can always affect some people, right? The people that are close to you, your colleagues, your peers, or the people around you. And everybody can do that. And um, how do you do it? Well, you ask questions. And, uh, to don't go in conflict, because if you try to change somebody else, you will get resistance. 
if you try to tell people what to do or how to do it, you will get resistance. Uh, the only thing you can do is to ask questions, because it, when you ask questions, you will make people think um, of the answer. Why are we doing it this way? What if we did it in a different way? What would happen if we tried something new? This kind of questions, to make the people around you start thinking about the questions and about doing it in another way. And then you create these agile islands that eventually can, can affect their environment. And this is a kind of a network change, let's say, a systemic change in the system that could also, uh, in the end, affect the top layers. Today you asked me about uh, why I think managers resist to change. And now I'll ask you, what do you think about why they resist? Okay, so we go back to the topic of uh, managers, and this is the million dollar question because this is what everybody is asking, right? Why do managers resist change? Uh, and it's because of their position, their status, the money, the power. It's a nice situation to be there. And it's also, you know, the, the golden cages. We can, we can take that. Uh, what we have been doing in large organizations is that we have put leaders in golden cages. That means that they are still uh, at the company. They are not performing anymore. They may have performed in the past, but now they are not performing anymore. They have a lot of salary because the salary has gone up during their time in the company. And they are now waiting for retirement. And they are, they are not happy there anymore, but they are making too much money to stop working there. They know they will never get that money somewhere else. Then we put people in golden cages, and this is what happens to managers if they stay too long in a traditional organization. And who's to blame for that? Well, it's uh, ultimately it's through reward structure that we put in place, and that's HR's uh, responsibility to put in place reward structures that would not have this effect on people. Um, and it's not uh, fair for the person, because they are not happy anymore, but they can't quit. And it's not fair for the company, because they are not getting any performance out of that person either. So it's a lose-lose situation. Mais pergunta, gente? Pode fazer em português, uh, there is an alternative to the up and or out situation that you talk a lot about, and I like the way you treat this. Can you talk more about it? And it, maybe it's uh, something to work with the coding. Uh, yes, yeah, so instead of up and or out, we can work with alternative career paths. So we can move laterally, or we can move maybe down in responsibility for some time. We are working together with the people, and the people are going through life. It can be ups and downs. We need to adjust the career path to the situation of the, of the person. Sometimes you have small children. Sometimes you take care of elderly parents. Um, in some situations in your life, you want to achieve less, have res less responsibility. Maybe you, you want to develop into a different um, area. Maybe you are in IT and want to learn about HR or finance or marketing or something else because you're interested. And the people who learn a lot and work around in the company they get a very good view of how it works. How, how does the whole company function? Uh, and this is a very good employee. The best employees have had many, many job roles in a company because then you get the whole picture 
of an organization. And you can work much better in the role you end up in. So I would recommend that you have a reward structure that would reward when you change job role. Uh, one part of the reward structure should be that how many job roles did you have within our organization? Because it also signalizes loyalty. You have been loyal to the organization, which may be important as well. I don't think age is important. I don't think uh, gender should affect rewards. And I think that if you uh, don't uh, raise uh, salaries, um, focusing on potential performance, if you see what I mean, the possible performance of somebody, but you actually focus on decoupling the fixed salary uh, that you have. You have a fixed salary, and then you have maybe a variable uh, salary as well. So if you decouple the fixed salary with a variable salary, then you can uh, have, a, you, you can still reward the people who perform, right? But if you stop performing, you will not continue to get that raise. Uh, which you do if, if we if we uh, merge it together, the fixed salary and the variable salary. Uh, so there are many ways of rewarding people in different ways. Um, we we have a lot of ideas of how to do that. Whether you're using only a, a salary formula or using merit money, for example, or different ways of performing. Topia, thank you. Uh, one of the questions I, I usually have when you talk about the uh, psychological safety and the the way we expect, for example, to allow the mistakes and the people grow and learn about their mistakes uh, are related to some kind of job or some kind of uh, areas or industries usually are not allowed to make mistakes. Like let's think, for example, a, a nuclear energy company that we, a kind of mistake could be huge, right? So what do you think you, you can balance the, the opportunity to learn from mistakes, but think about the business as usual in some place that we cannot make mistakes? How can balance that? You are bringing up very special areas. I, I wouldn't like to have a surgeon who wasn't really good at doing surgery, for example. <laughs> There are specialists in these cases that know a lot about what they do. And I wouldn't like my surgeon to have work around the hospital just to get more experience from other areas, because I want my surgeon to be really specific and a specialist in this. But in a knowledge company, we are talking about knowledge, knowledge companies here, not these industries where we have a lot of laws and regulations and where people can die uh, or the, the security and the harm is really huge when, when, when something goes wrong. Of course we need um, safety, we need uh, protocols, we need quality assurance and so on. But also another perspective on that, that I also told about in the class today, we have for example pharmaceutical companies and we have bank, the financial industry, you have a lot of laws and regulations around these industries, right? And probably in the nuclear power plants as well. But what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say is that when you have, you know that five people after me will control this as well, then you don't take as much responsibility for the thing as if you know that it's your head that will be chopped off, and uh, if somebody dies uh, over there, uh, then you, 
you're more accountable and you, you take more responsibility actually than if you have five other people controlling the same thing. Because then, okay, I know that uh, there are other people taking responsibility for this, so I don't do my job as well as I maybe could do. That's another perspective of it. So, is more layers of quality, does it lead to better quality? That's my question. Hi, I'm Cecilia, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about the performance, the traditional performance management process, because we definitely need some movement of that. So traditional performance management is something that I really like to talk about, because uh, I used to work as a performance management responsible at uh, Volvo Cars, in Gothenburg, and the traditional performance management process as we know it is when you set your goals after the budget uh, meetings in the end of the year, uh, all people will get their cascaded goals in the organization. Probably you get it from your manager as well, so you don't have that much say in what your goals should be, but you get them in your head. So to speak. And then you start to try to fulfill your goals uh, in the beginning of the year. You go on, you do that until uh, the mid-year review, somewhere in June, July, somewhere you have a mid-year review. And then you continue to try to uh, fulfill your goals until um, the review meeting, the performance rating is taking place in maybe November, December the next year after. And then you have had your goals for one year. And you didn't change them in a traditional organization. Why didn't you change them? That's obvious that you need to change your goals, right? But you didn't do that because your goals and the fulfillment of your goals is tied to a salary box. You get a grade in a five box grade like this. And you have a high performer, you have a weak performer, you have an average performer, and you have, you know, different names on these boxes. Every one of these boxes is linked to a corresponding salary box with a, a span, uh, a salary span that you can use for that particular box. So it's a very mechanic and rigid system. Uh, that is very easy to do for engineers because you can actually calculate exactly this person is ending up 3.45 on that scale and 5.36 on that scale and then they meet in this box and this is the box you are in and this is why you get this salary. Simple to explain to employees. You don't have to you know, negotiate or or have any reasons, because you see the math here, right? It's easy for engineers, and it's a very mechanic view of human beings, because we are not cogs in, in a machinery, right? We are made of flesh and blood, and we have feelings and thoughts and dreams and challenges. We are alive, and we are unpredictable. We are complex, adaptive systems as human beings. And the team is also an even more complex adaptive system. And an organization is an extremely complex adaptive system made of people. We are, the organization is not a machine. So that's why we cannot use the Tayloristic pay for performance methods that was created in Forge uh, factories, uh, you know, scientific management. That's the management theory that we are still using in many companies today. So that's what why we are saying that management has not evolved at all since Henry Ford's time. That's the traditional performance management process. And we need to get rid of it because it's tied to the yearly budget, 
you have your fixed performance targets tied to the bonuses. I need to reach my goals because otherwise I will not get my reward. If you do this, you get that. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with the budget system and the performance management cycle in today's organizations because as we know the world today, it changes all the time. And you can't make a plan one year ahead because you don't have a crystal ball to look into and see what is going to happen in one month, two months, uh, half a year and the next year. And you can't uh, manage people because people are unpredictable. You can't control people and you can't control the future. And this is um, a way of thinking that many managers hold on to, that we have to manage people and we have to control the future. It's not possible. And it's time for managers to realize that, in my opinion. Your ideal for that, so we get rid of the performance management. But what should we do? Because uh, it's easy for me to understand because I'm working with that. I, I saw that it's really bad things, controlling and etc. But also, I don't see like for the future of the working etc. I don't see like how to do it. So what we need to do is to change the budgets, um, not do the planning in the autumn, but doing um, planning all the time, right? Like in, in agility, you do more planning for the, the weeks coming and less planning for the year ahead. And we change when we need to change. We work with the relative goals, so it's about improvement rather than reaching a certain target. Um, it's about everybody improving all the time in the whole organization. And we can use techniques such as objectives and key results, or we can measure the temperature on the organization with different kinds of KPIs, key performance indicators, um, to see take the temperature, so to speak, on the organization. So relative goals and the unbiased rewards. And um, you know, there are many, many different ways of doing this. But the important thing is that you get rid of, of the, the, the hurtful performance management process and do it. It's even better to not, don't have anything than to have that process because it leads to worse performance. They have seen in company after company after company that it doesn't improve performance. Instead, it has the opposite effect. So why are we doing performance management? Ask that question first. Why are we doing it? And then we can find different ways of working with all of the purposes. This is part of the Agile HR course that, that you are doing, Tiago, and I am doing as well. So if it's learning and development we want, then we can work with trial and error, experimentation, modern learning tools. This is how we learn and develop. Uh, we don't need to have that excuse to, to work with the traditional performance management. Is it um, compensation decisions that we want to be able to do? That's the most common reason for keeping the up-to-date uh, performance management process. Then we have a lot of different new techniques and tools to work with rewards and compensation in a different way than, than the old way. So, read my book, attend the course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know, but it's not this course that we do right now. Yeah, the Agile People course is more for HR and HR processes and 
uh, read a chapter about performance management yeah. in my book. <laughs> you can get some ideas. Now she's having a coffee. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Não, mas... Ah, pode falar. Eu acredito na diversidade. Então, a gente tem que ter um trabalho em uma empresa que aceita pessoas mais de 50, menos, menos. E agora, na visão dela, como que a gente pode equilibrar isso com a agilidade? Qual a visão que ela tem de poder equilibrar a diversidade que a gente tem de técnica para mulher, para negros, para tudo, com a agilidade? Uh, the question is about diversity, how to balance agility and diversity, how to work with diversity and have agility in the company, if uh, ages and women, men, gender. Um, I don't really understand the, the conflict here. Is there a conflict between agility and diversity in your opinion? or? Yes? Uh, because I see diversity is a natural part of being agile, right? We need different perspectives and different people. And as I also said in the training today about diversity, we are quite good, at least in Sweden, to, uh, to respect diversity in different ways when it comes to religions or color or or background or gender or religious or sexual orientation and so on. We are quite generous and open for different kinds of people and perspectives and so on. But what we don't think about so much is that we also need cognitive uh, diversity. It's, uh, I mean, we can look exactly the same, but think in totally different ways. And that's why you need to know what's behind the behavior, under the surface, what is my intention, uh, and what is my why. And that's why we also use tools like the risk motivation profile in Agile People, where we look at the, the why and the intention behind the behaviors, because behavior and the psychological need is not the same thing. Uh, behavior is one thing, but the intention behind the behavior is something else. You need to understand the motives of people uh, to be able to also understand differences between people and why, uh, why we are so different. But this is just actually it's something good. Uh, and, I'm, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about. If, should we then recruit only agile people? Should we only recruit people with Agile values? Or shall we also recruit people with other kinds of values? And somebody's nodding here. Yeah. Yes, we should. <laughs> because even in an Agile company, we have legal people. And they need to be, have a high level of, of order and structure, which is the opposite of Agile people who want more flexibility and improvise more. But of course, we also need people who honor rules and policies, because we also have external rules and policies, the constraints of the systems that we need to follow. So diversity becomes a necessity. And it's only a problem if we don't understand that differences is something good. And we can handle the differences in the team. If we can handle the differences, then it's just a good thing with diversity in an agile team. We need different perspectives and competences. And as long as we keep conflict on a healthy level, it's OK. We don't move towards personal attacks. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the way we, we view conflict in agile people is the way that Patrick Lencioni has a really good um, kind of model for this. At the one end, we have artificial harmony. This is when nobody is speaking up because everybody is really afraid of you know, saying something wrong or doing something that they shouldn't be doing. Uh, 
and um, it's a blame game going on in this organization, let's say. So we have artificial harmony. It seems like everything is fine, but you don't find engagement in that kind of organization. And this is very, very common. At the other end of the pool, we have personal attacks, right? When people openly attack each other for their personality or something else. This is very bad to be there. But in the middle, we have a level where we have healthy conflict. So it, it, the trick here is to keep that balance. And uh, why do people not want to move in that direction from artificial harmony to, to uh, the healthy level of conflict? Is because one step further in that direction feels like one step closer to hell, because hell is over there with the personal attacks. <laughs> So they don't move in that direction. But high-performing, mature, agile teams can move in that direction until they hit this point, the balance point, and they can even cross that point because they know that they can move back again to that side, the safe side, the green side, let's say. Um, uh, because they learn how to do it. So we healthy levels of conflict is when people have a voice and they use their voice. Even if they don't agree always, they say that they disagree. And they say why they disagree. Because they have maybe a different perspective. And then we can discuss, right? And if we, in the end, we need to make a decision anyway, right? And then it's about, how do we make decisions then in that kind of company? And there are many different tools and techniques that we can use for making decisions in such a company. Delegation poker is one of those tools. Another tool is consent decision making. And consent decision making is not about everybody has to agree. It's not consensus. It's another thing. And this consent decision making is from a framework called uh, Sociocracy 3.0. It's a guy called James Priest who created that. And we have many, many different decision-making tools. I think Jürgen Apollo came up with a 16. whole 16, 16 different right. ways of making decisions in agile organizations that doesn't involve one person, one man manager making the decision, but it's about decision based on collective intelligence instead. So people's voices are being heard. And we don't need consensus all the time because that takes too long time to, to reach consensus. If everybody's going to agree, we cannot expect a decision in the coming year, let's say. Today she said that I have to disagree with Tiago. Yes. Thank you for that. I have a personal question, but first, Maria. What do our principles agility trains in the next two years? Main agility trains. The main agility trains for the next two years. The trains. The strains. The strains with agility. Strains. Strings. Trains. The trends in trains. agility. Okay. Artificial intelligence, systemic HR, value stream organizations, um, so organizations based on value streams instead of departments and the reporting lines and, uh, and so on, not top down. Um, what, what was the fourth thing that we examined last week? I forgot the fourth one. <laughs> you always forget one. But artificial intelligence will be very big, of course. But I don't know if it's within agility or not. It doesn't really matter. It's a huge trend that, that will affect everything, I think. Systemic HR is when HR understands that they are part of a bigger system. And um, it's not a function anymore. But it's, uh, we're running it in a totally different way. Hybrid work, of course. Yes. 
the fluent workforce. That's a huge trend as well. The fluent workforce, it means that the employee form uh, will not be as common. It's just a few years away that people will be freelancers. They will also start their own companies and offer their services to companies. And we work in, in networks and with partners instead of uh, being employees in one company. So flexible work um, arrangements, flexible work contracts, flexibility in where, when, how, and with whom we work. More common, a lot of flexibility, and, and people will demand this kind of flexibility. The, the, the companies that force people back into the offices now will be, will be losers, I'm sorry to say. We need to let people choose themselves when and where and how to work. And then we need to let them take the responsibility to self-organize with the people that they work together with so that they go and have the meetings necessary in the office with the people that they work close with. And we need to trust them to be able to do that. So it's a matter of trust, I guess. Yes, but there's a question. I have a question based on this. Um, if this is the future, if we are going to be all freelancers and work freely at home or it doesn't matter where, what are the main characteristics of this new guy of work. So what should I focus to make sure that I'll be employable in the future? Yes. Okay. I think we need to focus on becoming more T-shaped. Do you know the concept of T-shaped people? Yes. So you, you may have one or more specialist area but you also have a broad general base. We talked about T-shaped and then it became pie-shaped and then it became M-shaped and you had, you know, develops like this. But there is, a, of course, a, an end to how many different topics can you specialize in. But you, what I think is the most important is not that you learn a certain area, but I think it, the most important thing is your attitude towards learning. Yeah, that you are open for learning new things. And that's what I think that HR departments need to focus on as well. People who are willing to learn and develop. Because if you're open to learn and develop, it doesn't matter you can learn and develop into the roles that will be the trend for the future. Yeah. I read uh, somewhere, I don't remember where, uh, you say you need to manage process and develop people. Um, how can we do that in this new kind of work? How can we help people to grow in this, uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, relation work? How can we help people grow and develop? Uh, this new kind of uh, uh, work where when we are not employed anymore. We are freelancers. freelancers. We are freelancers. We need to take care of our own self-development. Yes. And of course we can support each other, right? But we are ultimately, we, we develop ourselves. And we make sure that we also help other people to develop. Uh, and networks, communities, all this kind of uh, communities of practice, what you call it. In organizations there will be this kind of communities of practice for consultants, for freelancers, for employees, for, you know. But, but I think that the, the, the part of the employee workforce that, that will be employed will be smaller. And the part that will not be employed in a traditional kind of employment contract will be larger. 
and all different kinds of flexible work arrangements will pop up. And it's already happening. And it's going really fast. AI is a game changer here as well. How much of HR's work could be done by AI? But, but we still need a people who can ask the right questions. We talked about it, right? You ask a question to a chat um, GPT, for example, and you will get an answer that is not really correct. Because I asked about future trends for HR, for example. I asked chat GPT a couple of weeks ago. And then it mentioned a lot of things, almost everything it mentioned. But it didn't mention the thing that I thought was the most important trend for HR for the future of work, and that was systemic HR. So then I said to Chat GPT, what about systemic HR? Oh yes, you are right, absolutely, <laughs> systemic HR is, you know? So it will just give you what you feed, it seems. So, I mean, you still need to be smart. But of course, they will get smarter and smarter. <laughs> it's funny, but you can, by asking more precise questions and doing that in many, many iterations, I found that I will get better and better answers all the time. You can't just ask once, because then you get not such a valid answer. You need to, to do it many times, and then it seems to learn and to find new answers to, to the more detailed question. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I have my personal question, maybe the last, and about the, there is one Agile People principle that I love, and I know that you are my lead by example of this, it's about uh, no people deeply. Can you talk about this particular principle? Yes, uh, the more we know the people we work with, the deeper we know the people we work with, the more we are going to start to like those people. Because when you get to know people, you start to like them. Have you noticed? Even if I see a stranger, I start to, to talk to that stranger and we spend some time together, I tend to start to like that person because I understand that person in a better way. And when you understand each other, when you know each other more deeply at work, you tend to work better together because you know what, what drives that person and you know what that person likes and dislikes. And you know something about their private life as well, maybe. And then work comes more smoothly. Uh, you feel safe also. You feel safer than if you don't know the people. You start to trust each other. That's another effect. And when you trust each other, you also work better together, and you produce better value together for your customers. And since agility is all about creating customer value, we need to get to know each other better at work. And how do we do that? It's about spending some time talking about your private life, not thinking that you can optimize by only talking about work. And it's also maybe doing some different conversations and having, um, you know, talking about difficult topics like we do in the psychological safety game or using tests like the risk motivation profile. Um, or, or other personality tests and then comparing answers and discussing answers and getting to know the people that you produce value together with, I think is extremely important. Thank you. And you talk about the customer. Then. Let me show her this chair. You are, no, this chair you are seeing. Can you, they have this, no, uh, Thank you. this is Click. the customer. So every meeting room, they have a chair with this. The client is our uh, reason to exist. Mm -hmm. So to remember that we have to talk about our client. So I love this idea. Congratulations.
And alguém tem uma pergunta que assim, se você não fizer, você não vai conseguir dormir hoje. Né? <risos> fale agora ou fale isso para sempre. Gostaram do Valeu a pena? Ah, the last one. Só quero falar um pouquinho sobre essa ideia da cadeira, né? Do, do cliente. O Brain não, conhece, não começa nenhum projeto sem um cliente real na mesa. Esse é o jeito de a gente entregar valor. É, se o Agile entregar valor a cada sprint, a cada pequena corrida, né? A resposta, se eu estou agregando ou não valor, é se o cliente vê valor naquilo que eu estou entregando na sprint. Hoje a gente tem 20 squads rodando simultaneamente com projetos de saúde, indústria, água, turismo, um monte de coisa. Mas a pergunta ao final de 15 dias é, continue entregando valor? Resolver a sua dor? Né? Você pagaria uma sprint a mais esse squad? Né? Toda vez que o cliente diz sim, a gente continua. Quando ele diz não, a gente mata o projeto. E é uma dificuldade de celebrar o erro. Né? A gente precisou criar uma celebração do erro e quando não entregar valor, que bom que eu não levei o projeto adiante. Que bom que eu não lancei um produto que ninguém ia comprar. Que bom que eu não gastei mais dinheiro do cliente ou do orçamento da companhia. Então esse é um jeito que a gente aprendeu a lidar com a agilidade, com a entrega de valor, colocar de fato o cliente no centro, na mesa. Né? E o outro ponto que eu queria comentar sobre performance, né? KPIs ou OKRs, é, o Brain, quando foi criado, a gente tinha uma ambição de gerar 500, não, de gerar 50 milhões adicionais em 5 anos. E isso foi uma ambição e não uma meta. E quando se tornou uma ambição, o time fez o ano passado 600 milhões no quinto ano. Se tivesse sido a meta, a gente ia ter feito 52, 53. Né? E esse ano a gente vai fazer 1.2 bi. Então a meta era 60 por por sexto ano, 10 milhões a cada ano. Então, acho que o OKR ajuda a gente a adicionar um pouco mais. Isso tem sido um aprendizado para nós aqui. E fico à disposição da gente poder falar mais do nosso case e conhecer um pouco mais. Depois disso, nós podemos traduzir e fazer um pouco de coisa, porque é muito interessante a maneira como eles trabalham com nós. Eu acho que eu posso Gente, é, são três da manhã para ela. É, é, uma salva de palmas. Thank you everybody. Thank you for having me. It was really nice meeting all of you. É, a gente vai sortear o livro dela agora e para ser rápido, eu tenho a lista aqui na planilha de quem se inscreveu. Está é, entre o número 4 e o número 50. Eu vou pedir para ela falar o um número. Se a pessoa tiver aqui, a pessoa ganha o livro. Se não, se não, não. Se faz um outro número. A gente conta. Um número entre 4 e 50. 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 Um número entre Agora eu vou chamar a Eliane. É, a Eliane. 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 Minha gestora Eliane é a da Fans Manager. Ok. Good.
Gente, tem, tem bastante comida lá, bastante, bastante. Não pode sobrar. Não pode sobrar. Uh, vamos aproveitar, fazer network, fazer troca. Ah, fazer uma foto com todo mundo, vamos fazer também. E vamos aproveitar, vamos fazer essa troca, se conhecer, falar desse assunto todo, tá? Provavelmente a Tia vai querer ir pro hotel descansar. Mas a gente pode ficar mais um pouquinho aqui e aproveitar o espaço. Pra ficar vamos. Só tinha mais medo, né? Vamos pra frente aqui, vamos tirar uma foto todo mundo junto? Ah é, vamos virar, né? acho que é mais fácil de ficar por causa da luz, né? Bom, tem luz, tá tudo modelado. Acho que o motorista já tá ali. Ah, uma foto. Então rápido, gente. Rápido, rápido. Quem vai tirar? Eu posso tirar. Vou pedir para as meninas lá da portaria tirar. Selfie. Tirou a portaria? Sim. Mas você precisa ir para o lado. Sim. Sim. Atrás das cadeiras, ou nas cadeiras. Tá certo? Olha lá, tá pra gente, tá pra você. Peraí, tá pra cadeira. A Jaiô. A Jaiô. Many pictures. Muitas fotos, todos os anos. Alguém precisa de ajuda, não? Tira para ele participar. É, ele não vai falar. Eu tenho que ir para o outro. O vídeo está indo. Tira essa foto aqui, ok? Tira essa foto aqui, ok?